So uh, it is well established that I am a huge fan of presidential history. Uh, I love examining uh, like the, the wives and some of the challenges that these individuals went through uh, and also their different leadership styles. And there's one place that I've never been to before that I have always wanted to go. And it is right here at Mount Vernon, the home of our very first president, George Washington. Now, whenever people think about Mount Vernon, uh, if, if you're like me, what you're typically thinking about is, is the house. Uh, but Mount Vernon is so much more than just the home. Uh, as you can see, like this place was really a, a small village and, and there were a lot of people who, who lived here at Mount Vernon. So anyway, uh, we're gonna take a little bit of time to, to wander the grounds here first, uh, and then we're gonna come back to the house. Look at this. This is a tulip poplar, and, and this is what we would call a, a witness tree. Uh, Washington had it transplanted here in 1785 uh, to, to kind of line the grounds here at Mount Vernon. Uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty stunning to think that uh, this tree has, uh, has been around for so long. Huh. All right, so this area that I'm walking into right now is the upper garden. And uh, we're here a, a little bit early, so there aren't really any uh, flowers in bloom, which is okay. Uh, one thing that I did want to point out though, is you can see like on the outer edges of the garden, uh, well, that's where you would have, you know, some of your, uh, I guess more, um, aesthetically pleasing flowers, you know, things that look nice and smell nice. But Washington was also a very practical man. So on the interior of the garden, well, that's where you would have uh, your, your different vegetables and uh, different things like that. Uh, this greenhouse here is not original. The original one burned down, but they used the documents from the fire insurance policy to reconstruct it. Yeah, very nice. One thing I really like about this visit to Mount Vernon is that whenever you come here, you're not only learning the story of George and Martha Washington, but you're also learning the story of the enslaved people who worked here. Now we're probably gonna tackle that in a little bit more depth in another video, but there were about 90 enslaved individuals that, that worked here on, on the mansion site, um, and a lot of them, would have been working right here in this garden and uh, in this greenhouse. Yeah, pretty fascinating. So what, what do we got going on here? We're training some steers. Steers that get to be mature at four years old are then called oxen. Okay. But they're not oxen yet, they're steers in training. Nox and spud. Huh. So they're pulling some logs today, just really for conditioning and training. The bigger and stronger they get, the more we can try to pull with them. Okay, interesting. Kind of like going to the gym. <laughs> All right, <laughs> thanks. So also here on the grounds of Mount Vernon uh, was a blacksmith shop. And something that's pretty cool that they are doing here is that they have people actually working inside the blacksmith shop, so you can see how some of these different tools and items were, were made. Okay, so here you can see some of the different things that are being made right here in the blacksmith shop. What we're looking at here are the overseer's quarters. So Washington was gone quite a bit from Mount Vernon, so the overseer would kind of run the operations with all of the farms at Mount Vernon and uh, received an annual wage 
of $133.33 plus board, bed, and lodging. Huh. Now, again, Mount Vernon is more than just the mansion. You're, you're looking at really a, a village here. So this is the spinning house. Uh, so you can see, you know, this old spinning wheel here and uh, this loom where they would make fabrics and clothing um, from linen. Uh, they would, you know, cultivate hemp for rope. Uh, they did stuff with cotton and silk. And of course, this would all have been done by the enslaved laborers and, and hired weavers that uh, would have worked right here to produce textiles for the Washingtons. So uh, again, I just want to reiterate that Mount Vernon is more than just the mansion. Uh, there are so many different things here to see, uh, like the, the clerk's office and quarters right here. Uh, then you also have the smokehouse. Now, as a person who enjoys smoked meats, I had to show the inside of the smokehouse. So of course, here in the middle is the fire pit. Uh, so they would put green leaves in there to, of course, uh, generate more smoke. Uh, and then this barrel is showing how they would salt the meat. And if you'll notice, whenever they have the barrels upended, there are holes in them. Well, that was to help drain some of the liquids. So before they would cook the meat, well, they would have to rehydrate it. And then you can see up here where they have all of these uh, different quarters and sides that are suspended to uh, to get smoked. One other interesting thing to note about the smokehouse is the elevated door. Well, that's to keep animals out. Another interesting little tidbit here. Here's something else that I didn't know about Mount Vernon that I found interesting. Uh, this is a working animal farm. So they have uh, sheep and, and cattle here, and uh, the animals that are raised here are used to provide livestock to other museums. So yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> what we're looking at right here is called the necessary or we might better know it as an outhouse, which by the way, that's probably the fanciest outhouse I've ever seen. Here's what I found really interesting about this. Inside this gate right here is the lower garden. Well, this is a trap door that opens and uh, you can collect, uh, let's say the, uh, the, the products of the necessary and then haul it out to the garden for fertilizer. Fascinating. Kind of nasty, but fascinating. Alright, so what we're looking at here is the lower kitchen garden that I just referred to. Uh, this would have been overseen by Mrs. Washington and uh, of course would have been worked by the enslaved people here at Mount Vernon and uh, would have been fertilized with the byproducts from the necessary. Okay, and here is the uh, front end of what they call the necessary. And uh, if you walk up here, it's, um, it's kind of nice, you know, for a necessary. Has uh, three different holes, all kind of angled towards each other so that you can sit uh, with your friends and maybe talk business while you do your business. So here's something that I had never heard of but found interesting. Uh, apparently George Washington didn't want fences obstructing the nice view from Mount Vernon, but at the same time you don't want you know farm animals right up there on the porch. So they constructed these things called haha -ha walls, which were even with the landscape on top so it wouldn't ruin the view, but then you have uh, like this wall with a ditch by it that keeps the farm animals from getting up there towards the mansion. Yeah, kind of interesting. So this is what is referred to as the east front of the Mount Vernon mansion. And uh, something that's kind of interesting, if you look at the top there at the cupola, 
Well, if you would have opened all of those windows, it would have served as air conditioning for the home. And then, of course, uh, Washington, after having led the country in the revolution, uh, was committed to peace. So you see the dove of peace there at the top. And uh, boy, there is a reason that they chose this location to build the mansion. Because if you look to the east, man, look at the view. Quite the scenic spot overlooking the Potomac here. All right, so we're back around now to the house. And uh, before we go inside, there's something that, that I wanna show that is just really fascinating. So if you look at the exterior, well, you might think that this home is made of stone. And Washington would have been quite happy if you would have said that. Uh, this is actually all made of wood that is cut to look like stone and then whenever they painted it well they would throw sand on it to kind of give it this rough stone looking texture this is a process called rustication pretty fascinating all right so uh, we just got in here into the mount vernon home and uh, the area that I'm standing in now is called the, the Central Passage. So as you would have walked in through this door, uh, one of the enslaved individuals that lived here, a gentleman by the name of Frank Lee, would have greeted you. Um, and then depending on your social status, well, uh, if you were of a lower social status, there was a row of chairs here that you might sit at. But if you were part of the genteel class, well, there's a room right here that you would have been welcomed in. Now, I know a little bit about Mount Vernon. Uh, but there are people here, obviously, who know a lot more, such as this guy right here. This is Jeremy Ray. He is the Director of Interpretation. So he's going to kind of walk us through Mount Vernon and uh, tell us a little bit about this historic home. All right. Well, thanks, JD. Uh, to begin with, the Central Passage area here that we're standing in is part of the oldest section of the home. Now, the whole house is, is original, but when George Washington inherits the property and moves in, in 1754, it consisted of this passageway and these two rooms on either side of us. There was a half story garret space above as well, and George Washington expands the home into the 21 room mansion it is today over his lifetime here. Uh, as you mentioned, Frank Lee, the enslaved butler, greeted guests at this doorway. Uh, some items in this room I want to point out this, this front parlor is a little uh, more formal. Uh, you can see here on the right, we have some portraits of General Washington and Mrs. Washington. Uh, some of the earliest known uh, portraits of General Washington. This is not an original piece, but uh, a replica of that uh, portrait. Uh, Washington is really uh, growing into society in the 1760s, uh, early 1770s before the Revolutionary War, and he is greeting uh, men of note from the House of Burgesses and so forth. Uh, men like George Mason, for example, one of his neighbors. Uh, they meet uh, most likely in this room uh, several times uh, in the 1760s and discuss things like taxation without representation. Okay, so this is the front parlor room that Jeremy was just describing. And uh, typically it's, it's closed off to tours, but they told me that if I took off my shoes and promised not to break anything that, that I could come in here. Uh, but man, you can just imagine the conversations that took place in this room. Uh, conversations that, that really helped to, to shape this country. So, yeah, pretty amazing. The other parlor over here is a little bit more of a family space. Uh, we're currently doing some preservation restoration work in here. It's a constant effort. Uh, Mount Vernon is privately owned by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association of the Union. And this private nonprofit has owned and operated the house, has, has had it open to the public since 1860. So preservation and restoration work is a constant everyday uh, action here. On the other side of the hallway, we see the dining room. Note the bright green color. The colors in the house are accurate to 1799. We've done a lot of 
uh, paint analysis and research work to get it as accurate as possible. Then use primary source documentation, uh, Washington's letters, his, his accounts, purchases, uh, accounts from visitors who were here in Washington's time to recreate these spaces as accurately as possible. The ceiling here, it's really, really unique. It's one of the oldest original ceilings in the United States. Here in between these rooms, we see this large key that was a gift to Washington from the Marquis de Lafayette. That's the key to the Bastille. That was a prison in France. It was stormed at the outset of the French Revolution. Citizens of Paris stormed that prison and uh, the Marquis de Lafayette was actually in charge of the demolition of that fortress later. You can see this pencil sketch down here showing the fortress being taken apart. The key was a gift to Washington uh, with a nice letter from Lafayette saying something to the effect of, you know, this is a symbol of liberty to its patriarch. And Washington put it on display in the presidential mansion in Philadelphia. When he returns to Mount Vernon, he places it here. This is one of the few original objects that were still in the house when the Ladies Association purchased the estate uh, and started to do that preservation work. This room here is one of 10 bed chambers in the house. Feel free to step on in there. Um, one of 10 in the house, one of nine for family and guests. This room being on the first floor, probably a little more comfortable in the summertime. As hot air rises, it might be a little cooler down here. Uh, very nicely appointed, so it's, it's possible that some of the um, more higher ups uh, visitors that, that came to visit here would have stayed in this room. I really like this painting. It is uh, the Battle of Menden. It is original, and it is, it's actually the battle during the Seven Years War that the Marquis de Lafayette's father died. Um, so we, we have that Lafayette connection here uh, in the artwork as well as with the, the key to the Bastille. So this is Washington's study. We're actually here in the private wing of the home. Uh, when General Washington and Mrs. Washington lived here, uh, this whole wing of the house was generally inaccessible to guests. Uh, you had enslaved individuals like Caroline Branham and Charlotte, who was a seamstress, who worked with Mrs. Washington in their bedchamber here in the private wing. And in this space, Christopher Shields, General Washington's enslaved valet, was uh, admitted access in and out of this space. Uh, but otherwise you had to have written permission from the general to access this area. So this study is his office. This is where he's operating this busy plantation, right? Um, the books over here to my right, uh, these are replicas of the library that he had here uh, on the estate. Uh, it's a very difficult for us to kind of preserve, uh, control the, the environment so we don't keep any original uh, books in this space, but you can see it was quite extensive, right? Washington didn't have an opportunity to go to college like his older half-brother Lawrence, who you can actually see in this original painting over here. Um, so Washington, his formal education really ended around the modern equivalent of like seventh or eighth grade. So Washington was continuously reading to make up for what he called a defective education. Uh, so he was constantly trying to learn, but it also instilled in him this excellent leadership quality and that he recognized strengths in others that could do things that he couldn't. Uh, so as, when he was commander in chief during the war and as president, he made sure that he put people with exceptional abilities into positions where they could make a difference. And uh, I think that's, that's an excellent leadership quality to understand your own shortcomings uh, to make sure that others can help you and everyone succeed. So hi. Absolutely love this room. Uh, here are a few things that Jeremy pointed out to me. Uh, this is uh, trunk number 13. This is the original trunk that Washington would have used, one of them that he would have used during the Revolutionary War. Uh, he's very organized. This one would have held like blankets and such. But the, the piece to me that is so interesting is this one here. This is a fan chair. And you can see it has like these little pedal things down here on the bottom. Supposedly Washington saw this whenever, or something like this whenever he was in Philadelphia and then had one made. And uh, the idea is you work those pedals and that fan up there is supposed to swing back and forth and keep you cool. Uh, but one of his secretaries joked that it just kept flies away. <laughs> Very interesting.
Washington was president, there weren't any term limits. He could have served a third or a fourth. He was unanimously elected to both terms. So uh, yeah, I think it it's, makes sense that he could have continued uh, being elected as president. But Washington sends out in a paper that he's not going to serve a third term. In doing so, he sets an example of the peaceful exchange of power between elected officials. But he also sets an example that this position, this office, is not a lifetime position. This is not a space that's supposed to be abused by anyone. The power entrusted in the president, in George Washington, was given to him by the people. And this was him publicly, publicly relinquishing that power back to the people to elect a new leader. And I think that's something that's very, very uh, important because you think about it, revolutionary leaders, it's not very often that they willingly give up power. We have, history is full of examples of Julius Caesar and Oliver Cromwell and later on Napoleon, right? People who go to these great efforts, lead a revolution, but then hold on to power. Washington gave it up not once as president, but again, as commander in chief, he resigned his commission. So he, he fully understood that the power of the people was something that was to be respected in this country. Okay, so here's something else that's pretty interesting. Um, I was told that this dining room table uh, you can see is kind of small so whenever the washingtons would have kind of like a, a dinner party or something like that well this table could be joined with this table and then they would move it to the new room uh, which is where we're going to be heading here in a little bit so we're entering into the new room now and it was called the new room because it was that last, it was the last space that Washington added to the house in that expansion project I was telling you about earlier. It starts with the smaller home that we were standing in in the Central Passage and then he eventually adds this space. And this was a very impressive room in the 18th century. Uh, the average home in Virginia during Washington's lifetime could fit in this one space. So it's gonna be very impressive to guess. Uh, so you see the big high ceilings, the intricate uh, plaster designs, uh, and Washington's really using this space as a multi-purpose room for entertainment, um, for meetings, greeting, large dinner parties, potentially, and things of that nature. Now, what's really interesting about this space is it really highlights a lot of Washington's past. We know that he was a soldier, fought in the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War. Uh, we have paintings up of Washington at Fort Planks Point during the Revolutionary War. We have some sketches of various battles that took place during the Revolutionary War, the Beth, uh, death of General Montgomery, uh, the death of General Warren. Uh, and Washington also has this lovely print over here of a soldier, a common soldier, showing the sacrifice uh, that was needed, that was given um, by everyone during the war. And it, it, it's a, an image of a soldier uh, with his wife mourning his death and their infant child in her arms. Um, so again, the impact of that sacrifice uh, was far more than people like George Washington, generals and colonels and so forth. The, the common American also sacrificed a lot. Um, but also this really highlights Washington's role as a farmer in this space. I'd like to point out this mantle. This is original. You can see uh, in the marble designs, we see farm animals, we see a plow. Uh, this was a gift to him from an English admirer, a man named Samuel Vaughan, who was an English merchantman. Um, and we also see farm tools in the plaster designs above all the doors and up on the ceiling. Washington was a wheat farmer pre predominantly. Uh, there were 317 enslaved individuals on this, on this estate, with the vast majority working in the outlying farms uh, producing that wheat. So that was just a little bit here at Mount Vernon. I am so glad that we came to this place today because uh, of, of all of the presidential sites, this is one of them that I've wanted to travel to the most and uh, learned so much. Uh, the place is huge. If you ever come here, schedule at, at least a day uh, because there is so much to see, way more than, than just the mansion. 
Uh, so anyway, we, we have a few more things that we're going to be looking at here at Mount Vernon, but that'll be in the next video.